All right. Good afternoon. My name is Shion Sengupta. I'm a partner on the investment team at Multicoin. I've been with the firm for a little over four years. We're going to talk about AI today. It's well understood that AI is an inflection point in technology. The velocity of investment dollars and resources going into building out these systems certainly reflects that. I think what's less well understood is that crypto primitives and capital markets are already playing a foundational role in the build out of these systems, and they're going to continue to do that. We're going to dive into the mechanics of that in some detail today. Before we dive in, a brief disclaimer. Please note this presentation is for educational purposes and should not be considered investment, legal, or financial advice. So the most clear reflection of the astounding rate of investment in AI is compute. So the $200 billion spent on chips and servers and racks and cooling systems and memory units over the last two years is just the beginning. We're going to see the numbers here pick up at a really, really rapid pace. But more generally, we've reached a point where AI systems are not bound by capital, they're bound by infrastructure. You know, we talk to some of the largest operators at some of the largest AI labs in the world, and the story is consistent. All of them say the same thing. They say, we have more access to compute than anyone else in the world, and it's still not enough. And so Kyle published a piece on the intersection of crypto and AI systems in July of 2023. And he highlighted the opportunity for distributed compute markets, or Airbnb for graphics cards. In November 2024, this remains the largest opportunity and the one with the most tangible progress made. Revenue-adjusted compute DVINs, or decentralized virtual infrastructure networks, are the single most pragmatic application of crypto and AI systems. They are coordinating resources at the lowest layer of the stack. But compute networks have been around for a while. Many founders over the past decade have tried to trace through the design space here. There's at least one high-performance GPU in every household in the world. If we could aggregate all of them together by giving them tokens, surely we could solve the compute crisis that we keep hearing about. We've tried this, and there's a few important results that are worth going over. The first is that compute is not a perfectly fungible commodity. And so the way to illustrate this point is to take a consumer-grade graphics card, consider the RTX 3090. Every Call of Duty player in the world has one of these in their homes. They do about 30 teraflops per second, or trillion floating point operations per second. That's just a unit of compute. And now take the NVIDIA A100. This is an enterprise-grade data center graphics card that's purpose-built for AI workloads. That thing does about 150 teraflops per second. You might think that you can take five of these 3090s around the world and then stack them together and get the same performance as an A100. That is simply not the case. The specific configurations that compute come in, that is, which resources are aggregated and then how are they networked, matters a lot. And so that means for every single GPU, its bandwidth, its memory, its storage capacity, its reliability profile, all of these things matter, not only for the individual device, but for how it links with the rest of the network as a whole. And so usually the graphics cards at home, they don't have the bandwidth of the memory configuration to fit into a production-grade network. Almost all AI workloads need some sort of enterprise or data, data center-grade capacity to be functional, and those data centers need to be networked correctly together. This style of networking in software is called orchestration. So that's how the network handles requests that come in and how each one of those individual nodes process those requests. And the second takeaway is that these networks are particularly well suited for inference. And so if you're an AI developer building a chat app or a co-pilot or an image generation tool, your primary interaction with AI systems is via inference. But the form factor in which those developers access these compute resources matters a lot. And so developers want to think of deploying and pricing workloads in very simple terms. These are called abstractions usually. And the most reduced version of an abstraction looks something like this. It's dollars per million tokens, and these are input or output LLM tokens. These are different from crypto tokens. These are the units of data that AI models process. So it's those tokens per model per region. And so this specific formulation you see on the screen here would give you about 25 to 50,000 question and answer pairs for an application built on Anthropic's Claude model, which I'm sure many of you have interacted with, at fairly low latency, high performance for people in the US. The best way to think about this is this is what developers want. Right? When they come to a compute network, this is what they're expecting. And so the takeaways from these attempts have been the supply side needs abstraction, the demand side, sorry, the supply side needs co-orchestration, the demand side needs abstraction, right? And so we'll unpack these further in the context of where compute networks are at today, and we'll start with the supply side. 
And so this is a map of all the data centers in the world today. And when we talk about AI in the abstract, it very much lives in this physical footprint here. Each one of these dots represents a mix of financing, of real estate, of chip capacity, of cooling systems, and they're all owned and operated by entities of various different sizes. Now, when we think about the service providers for AI workloads, we generally think of Azure or Core Weaver or any number of other hyperscalers. But I think the important observation here is that Microsoft Azure has control of less than 2.5% of these data centers. Core Weave has less than 15 basis points. Now, on an aggregate compute basis, the number is much larger. But just in terms of the physical units, what this map tells you is that the majority of data center units in the world are not organized into one cloud platform. And so it's these long tail operators, these smaller co-location providers, these enterprise managed services data centers that represent more than half the capacity in the world. And these are effectively startups. Many of these are smaller entities. A lot of them are operating fewer than five facilities. Most of these smaller data centers are more than capable of handling those basic inference requests. And a lot of them are even retrofitting their configurations with modern chips and advanced cooling systems and more energy efficient racks. So it's worth diving into this, right? Like, let's zoom in a little bit further on what's happening inside these data centers. And we'll look at it from a unit economics basis first. So we'll start with the left side on costs. As an owner or an operator of a data center, you are effectively running a factory. Either directly or indirectly, you're sourcing land, you're installing chips in servers and racks, you're sourcing power, you're sourcing water, you're sourcing cooling systems, you have physical security to maintain. You have very real fixed costs. And you can break those down roughly into CapEx depreciation on the hardware and then um, debt service on things like real estate. Um, for every minute that you're vacant or you're underutilized, you are foregoing earnings. And so you move over to the right side, your revenue model is generally twofold. You have leases with long-term partners for what are called reserved instances, and those are usually at a fixed rate. And then you have spot availability for new customers, and those are for on-demand short-term workloads, and those are usually at a variable rate. And so reserved instances are almost always priced cheaper on a per-hour basis than spot instances, so operators will make more per unit of compute on a spot instance than a reserved instance. But different data center operators have sort of different risk profiles when they think about what portion of the capacity they want to allocate to each of these buckets. And so the implication of this, which I'll spend most of the rest of this presentation explaining, is that there is live vacant compute capacity across this unlinked footprint of data centers that wants to come online and serve AI workloads, specifically inference. And the crypto is not just helpful, but necessary in aggregating this capacity. And so for a second, put yourself in the shoes of Boost Run. So Boost Run is a small data center operator in California. So you as Boost Run have about five megawatts of capacity, a few thousand GPUs sitting in servers across a handful of facilities. You have long-term contracts at reserve prices, and you have some portion of idle or vacant capacity uh, available for these spot markets, right? As Boost Run, your preference is going to be to want to have long-term contracts with reliable partners who pay you a predictable rate and are using as much of your capacity as possible. And the reason for this is because even though the spot market structure could be more profitable for you, you do not have access to developers in the way that a hyperscaler might have. Hyperscalers dominate the spot markets. And indeed, that's where most inference workloads are deployed. You know, a gold standard would be for you to find a way to lease to a hyperscaler, but they have extremely high bars for uptime and performance, and it's unlikely that you're, you're going to be able to get there. And so let's look at the other side of the equation now, which is the demand side. Consider a potential customer in Leonardo, Leonardo AI. And so that's a generative image model company that's focused on building these enterprise marketing assets. They were actually acquired by Canva recently for $370 million. Leonardo AI has very real inference costs for each output they generate. They pay those inference costs to a compute provider, likely on a spot market, likely on a hyperscaler, some, something like Azure. And so if you as Boost Run are able to offer the necessary abstractions to Leonardo AI to utilize your vacant capacity, you can price that workload cheaper than a hyperscaler, generate a return on that vacant capacity, and then potentially save Leonardo some money. Right, so hopefully you're starting to see here, the job to be done is to find a way to open up that spot market, like the hyperscalers do, so you can start generating some return on that capacity. And so, as we mentioned in the, in the first part of this presentation, the two things you need are an orchestration system and an abstraction system. An orchestration system is going to submit and batch those short-term workloads to your servers and racks without disrupting your long-term workloads. And then ideally, that's attached to a cloud platform that developers like Leonardo love to use 
and then it has all the abstractions they need because that means your vacant compute is more likely to get utilized on an ongoing basis. And so this configuration is an opportunity that a new class of cloud providers has already recognized. And these are usually called Neo Clouds. Some examples of these are Vast or FluidStack. So these are cloud offerings that are sourcing and orchestrating this compute vis-a-vis um, -vis latent data center capacity, and they're giving it to AI developers in the form factors that they want it in. But opening up the spot market is not enough. NeoClouds suffer from a standards problem that prevents data centers from around the world from organizing on a single orchestration standard, which is ultimately where the pricing power comes from, where, where lower inference costs come from. And so take Vast, for instance. It's a NeoCloud that is partnered with 50 or 100 data centers or so. That's less than a percentage point of the addressable market here. FluidStack has a similar number. Vast and FluidStack will silo data centers by region because they can't pay certain data centers over fiat rails. They may have specific compliance requirements about serving customers in certain regions. So if you're in Hong Kong or Kazakhstan, there's a re it may be very difficult for you to accept payment from a counterparty in the US. Now, this is a barrier to entry, but it's not, really, it's not nearly as hard as the payout structure, which is a much, much bigger problem. And so the issue with the payout structure that I was alluding to earlier is what we call the base state problem. So consider the server and boost runs facilities. It'll be our atomic unit for simplicity. When boost run adds itself to vast system, you'll notice that the spot market has opened up. It enables bids on this vacant capacity, and you're seeing all the orchestration and abstraction get handled. Amazing. So for this, for this hour, this data center and this server has earned 375 an hour, 125 from the long-term contract, 250 for the on-demand contract. Amazing. It's doing its job. But then when demand runs thin, boost run doesn't get paid. So in this instance, the data center is earning 125 an hour. It's not earning any, any sort of incremental yield from the, the spot market. And if this happens enough times, Boost Run takes its business elsewhere. It moves to a different orchestration system. It goes offline. Then when it comes back, it has less of a reputation score. It gets less jobs. In general, this causes churn on the supply side. And this is what we call the base state problem. It's what keeps data centers from organizing around a shared orchestration standard, which ultimately creates lower inference prices. So icons, or inference via crypto orchestrated networks, are better than NeoClouds. They are a feature superset of NeoClouds, so they handle all the orchestration, they handle all the abstraction, but they solve the base state problem that we just described. And so what icons like IO and Cusco do is they issue a steady stream of payouts via token rewards that align data centers on a shared orchestration standard. And so this is what creates that retentive supply, and that's what leads to those lower prices for developers. So let's run through the exact scenario that we just did on Vast system, but we'll do it on I.O. to show you what, how this works. So in this case, you can see that a data center is earning 475 an hour, 125 from the long-term recurring contract, 250 for the spot contract, and then $1 as what are called I.O. availability reward tokens. So I.O. is using token incentive to provide a steady base rate, ideally in dollars from customers, but backstop by I.O. tokens if demand thins. And so what you'll observe here is that even though demand has not directly showed up in the second instance, the data center is still getting paid. So the data center has earned for the server 475 an hour, 125 from the long-term contract, and then 350 as token availability rewards. And so what's happening here is that IO is effectively using its own token to compensate Boost Run for the risk it is taking in joining the network through these token denominated payouts from its own balance sheet. And so this is the construction that helps Boost Run retain supply capacity over time and again ultimately deliver cheaper entrance states. And so what these icons do is they turn vacancies that would be monetized via intermittent spot markets into reserved instance long-term workloads. We know that the smaller data centers like those reserved instance workloads. And so what's happening here is a form of financial engineering that is uniquely made possible by crypto capital markets. I was facilitating a transfer of risk between Boostron in the short term and then the platform power of IO in the long term when every data center on the planet is onboarded to this orchestration standard. And so in my presentation on the stage last year, I talked about how distributed physical infrastructure networks would solve global coordination problems by creating standards. Icons are structurally better positioned to solve the twin standards problems that prevent NeoClouds from attaining scale. They do this by having a base payment rate and tokens, which brings data centers onto a shared orchestration system, and they're not restricted by specific geographies because the network is inherently decentralized, which means it can handle payouts from all over the world. The two of these things, when paired with the right abstractions for developers, lead to reliably lower cost yet high performance workloads. We believe these are the components of a system that onboards the next 10, 15, 20,000 data centers, the hundreds of thousands of GPUs that are latent today, 
again, at low cost to developers. So I was live today, data centers onboard in less than a day, they get paid to be on the standard, they go direct to developers. Every example that I've mentioned in this presentation, Boost Run, Leonardo AI, they're supply and demand partners on the network today. They do $10 million in annualized GMV today, they have data centers from over 20 jurisdictions. And then the volume on the activity increases the platform power of IO tokens, which reifies the incentive for other data centers, which again leads to cheaper cost for compute. In fact, it leads to lower cost for compute today. IO charges 40% less than NeoClouds, charges six to seven times less than hyperscalers. And this demonstrates that retaining supply and acquiring demand on a single standard leads to more efficient market structure. And that as liquidity continues to build for a specific set of workloads, it becomes increasingly possible in practice to refine pricing on an atomic unit basis, and then we can treat compute as the commodity that it is. Today, many physical commodities are financialized. Oil, wheat, electricity, corn. Compute is the largest commodity market in the world that isn't financialized. And this is largely because compute is a virtual resource and it is infungible, so it's hard to price as a single instrument. But the ultimate vision for icons is not only to orchestrate these long tail data centers, but to financialize compute such that it operates as a robust commodity market. Naturally, if this commodity market is built, it will be built on crypto native rails, specifically on Solana, which aims to be decentralized NASDAQ, or in this case, decentralized CME. The icons we've described today are closing an arbitrage on the order of tens of billions of dollars. They're doing so in the right first order construction. We're thrilled to see them taking more of the market with each passing day until they eclipse the hyperscalers that we began this comparison with. Thank you.